Hi, everybody. My name is Lauren Miller and I'm the communications coordinator here with Farm and Food Care Ontario and we are on a grain farm in Brant County and uh, the farmer's name is Steve and I'm going to take you over to him in just a second uh, but if you have any questions make sure to pop them in the comments and we'll get Steve to answer them for you okay so just one second and here is Steve good afternoon I'm Steve Sickle I farm here at the north end of Brant County with my wife, Amanda, she has, works off the farm. My daughter, she's in grade 12. She's planning on going to Guelph this fall to be a large animal vet. And my son, he's in grade six. And he, all three of us farm here. I'm mostly the operator here. But they do help me out. Ethan's plant, Ethan planted corn for me on Saturday, so that's neat. Getting the next generation started. So I'm sitting here on four skids of seed for planting corn. We're not planting corn today. The calendar says we should be planting corn, but we just got uh, 32 millimeters of rain over the last two days. So we're doing other things these days. That's why the combine's out of the shop. We're uh, all the planters and sprayers are ready. So we're working on harvest equipment now when we're waiting for the soil to dry out because we cannot plant when it's too wet. We compact the soil and the seeds won't grow to their best ability when we don't put them in the best environment when the soil's dry. So this corn, is enough for 125 hectares of area of sea of field so a hectare is 100 meters by 100 meters if you picture the olympic oval where the athletes do the running the inside of that field is probably half a hectare so there's enough of these here for uh, about 300 fields of the olympic oval so i've got a whole lot of different well there's probably about eight different varieties here for example, this variety here is a 4640 by DeKalb. Doesn't matter the brand, that's the one I've chosen, but it's got a heat unit on the tag. Some of these varieties are 3,000 heat units, and some of them are down to about 2750. I will plant the longest day corn or the longest maturity first because it takes the most heat to get to maturity. So I will plant those varieties first. And then as I'm a week or two into planting, I'll plant the shorter day. And it also some varieties do better on different years versus others. So that's why you don't put all your eggs in one basket, just because one variety looks really, really good this past year. If I plant all that the next year and it's a different weather season, it could be a flop in that weather season. So you just put your eggs in different baskets, so to speak, and you have different varieties, but there's lots of trials out there by other farmers and government extension that lets me choose which varieties I want to do and I'll also do a little bit of trial work on my own split plantering putting two varieties in the planter at once and then when you combine you move over four rows and you get data from the combine that tells you which variety does better than others so as you can see I got a whole bunch of different varieties are kind of stacked here ready to go in the planter eight bags to a fill and 16 about 28 hectares to a fill along with dry fertilizer and away we go we're planting it I planted about 40 hectare, 30 hectares on Saturday when the ground was fit, but then we got rain. So we know everything works. It's always a little bit of uh, optimism in the spring. You're excited to get planting, but you know, sometimes you think you're ready. I've got this heated shop that all the equipment went through over the winter. You think you're ready, but it's always good to get in the field, get a little bit done and make sure everything's working top notch because whether there was a mouse that chewed a wire or a bearing that sat too long and failed, it's always good to get a few acres in under your belt to know everything's working and a rain a couple of rain days like this is perfect opportunity once you got some things working and you got some hiccups to get fixed perfect time to get them fixed so we'll step outside and have a look at the planter so here's the seeds each of those bags that you just saw in the shop has 80,000 kernels in them. And some seeds are bigger than others. These seeds are actually quite small. And I chose these to plant first because they are more tolerant to a cold weather event. Here's the compressor, it'll shut off in a couple minutes, in about a minute. So, and you'll notice that the seeds have different colors. This one here is our refuge variety. That is because of the seed treatment on them. We want to create a refuge. So this has a different seed treatment so we don't get resistance to our pets. That's part of our intensive pest management. You have to have 
two different modes of action and that's the way the seed companies do it so we don't get resistance so our technology keeps working to control some of the pests in the soil because if we don't have that we find we are planting early to get optimum yield some of your seeds may get especially in this cold soil the seeds aren't growing but they're sitting there they uh have more of them will live and have their optimum yield if we didn't we'd get eaten and it just it's easier to better to treat the seeds than to treat the entire field after you've got a problem because th this is a minute amount of insecticide versus blanket spraying the whole field in a couple weeks if you had to come back and do that so this seed is metered out by an electric meter in here has seed discs i can show you a little better there's a meat there's a disc in there that spins around and there's a vacuum that sucks the seeds against the disc and then the air is the vacuum from those seeds is cut off and then it falls actually this one is actually carried down a little bit of an elevator here and it's actually deposited in the seed trench at a dead drop so you don't get any bouncing and all the seeds are firmed into the trench with this plastic paddle here that firms them in the bottom of the trench and all of this is done with fair amount fairly high precision than what we were used to as a kid this is all mapped on my ipad in the cab and i can go back and dig up seeds and i know exactly what seeds where and where it'll be and this planter is kind of set up with a little bit more technology than some we've got hydraulic downforce here which measures the amount of force so i get the seed to depth without carrying too much weight or not enough weight on these wheels that would potentially compact the soil. Or if I don't carry enough weight here, I'm not getting my seed to depth. So if you're not to depth, then you're not getting consistent moisture uptake of your seeds or proper cover of those seeds. And with the amount, each seed bag that you just saw in the shop is worth about 300 bucks. We want to make sure each seed grows. The ideal situation is each seed grows and prefer produces an optimum and even cob to its neighbor in the field. So how many rows does this plant? This is an eight row planter at 30 inch spacing, 30 inch spacing this way. So this is 20 feet wide. So I can plant roughly, including stops to fill up, I can plant about 12 acres an hour with this, which is about four, four hectares an hour. So I have to stop about every two hours to fill up. And it works out if I put a bag of seed in each row and fill up with fertilizer. I'm putting the fertilizer down at around 80 kilograms. Oh, wait, 170 pounds to the acre. That's a lot of conversion to go from kilo to kilograms per hectare. <laughs> um, yeah, us farmers in Ontario are a funny bunch. We're metric and imperial units of measure all mixed in together. That's, I don't know if we'll ever change. No. It's just the way we were all brought up. And what are these? Those are the closing wheels. Old planter or planters usually have just a smooth wheel without these bumps. But because I'm no-till and plant green, I've modified and bought these additions to it. And they close the trench a little better without packing too hard around the seed and they'll still grow. If, before I went to those, I would find if I planted in damp conditions and then it dried that the soil, the trench would open up and I'd be able to look down the trench and see my seeds and they don't grow near as well. These tend to close and crumble the, seed, the soil around the seeds and they grow quite well. So let's have a look at the fertilizer here. So this is kind of set up how I fill it. So this is our fertilizer. This wagon will hold 10 ton, do enough for about 125 acres. So this blend of fertilizer is a 6-20-20. The 6 is the amount of nitrogen, the 20 and the 20 is the amount of phosphorus and potash in that blend. But there's also a bunch of micro micronutrients in this. It has a blend of sulfur, zinc, manganese, boron. Uh, that's the key ones of them. And we're finding where a lot of our yield limiting factors is our trace nutrients so if we put those in we know we get rid of that the lack of yield from that limiting factor rachel wants to know how long it takes for you to plant all your fields if i was if i had optimum weather and i slept about eight hours a day i could probably be done in about a week 
of planting corn. Now, I've also got to spray my fields as well. That takes, I can spray a lot quicker than I can plant because I got a lot wider sprayer than I do with the planter. But in my system, all I have to do is plant and spray because I'm no till and plant green. If I was a full tillage guy, I'd, I'd have to do tillage and I'd have to pick stones. We used to be a full tillage farm and we had a stone picker and windrower and that's a job I, as a kid I disliked. My kids dislike it, but they don't understand how many stones I used to pick and how few stones they have to pick now because of the system we've changed to. Okay. So when we fill up, we run this auger and it goes across, it goes into the cross auger and it fills up all these hoppers. And then there's an auger in the bottom of this that augers it across into, and puts the fertilizer down in a separate trench. And uh, ideally that the way this is set up is our fertilizer gets to be two inches beside and two inches below our seeds. So as the seeds start to grow, the roots should explore that fertilizer trench and really expand and have lots of roots to get all those nutrients out of that trench. Because our seeds are spaced about six inches apart. So about six inches of every trench of the that trench of fertilizer is available to each plant. So the way that we adjust our seed space, our speed adjust seed adjustment is done from the cab because it's all done with the electric motor. The fertilizer is old school. It's our rates are changed by Sprocket. Come on over here, Lauren. Don't trip over the top. Is this going to work? So depending on where I'm planting, I will change. Farming's all about math. I didn't re you don't realize it as a kid, but farming is a lot of math. So here's the math we got to figure out. There's a driven sprocket back here. Or sorry, a driver sprocket, and this is a driven sprocket up front. And I've got what was in the manual book wrote on here on the end of the fertilizer hopper. And this is pounds per acre that these sprocket combinations produce. So right now I'm set at 174 pounds with the combination I've got. Actually, sorry, 153 pounds. It works about 160 with the blend that I've got. Amber would like to know what you mean by picking stones. Picking stones is a job our farm equipment doesn't like stones. Any stone that's bigger than about that, our equipment does not like. Mainly, this plant, planting equipment, you've got to get stones through here. As you can see, I don't have a lot of room for a stone to travel through this area of the planter. So the stones can get jammed up there. Stones can get jammed up and stop these closing wheels. But the other thing the stones do is when we're harvesting soybeans, for instance, we got a stone that big and it's sitting right on top of the surface and we're trying to cut the beans that high. Stones come into the combine. Combine and stones do not get along. You're looking at a, could be a $50,000 repair bill if you put up the stone through a combine. There's safeguards in a combine to help stop that, but sometimes safeguards don't work. And so if you have to cut, you can tip the header back, combine and soybeans to avoid the stones, but sometimes there's pods that are within two inches of the ground and you have to leave those pods in the field and that's money left in the field. So I'd rather pick the stones. It's just night and sometimes wheat will lodge, which means it falls down because of nitrogen with too much nitrogen or just, or a wind storm knocks it down. And then you almost have to literally suck it off the ground with the combine. And if you know you've picked the stones in that field, you can have pretty good confidence that you can go after that wheat without feeding the stone into the combine because if the wheat's down, you can't see those stones. And what does no-till mean? No-till means I don't do any tillage. This planter, I will go right through last year's crop residue and plant directly into that. So if Lauren, if you turn around, there's a lot, there's last year's cornfield out there. Step this way, there's my cows doing some great. I also have some beef cows here. So no-till means these cows have been out here last, spring, last winter after I took corn up. Up. I combine corn here and the cows graze some residue off but I will plant I've got a cover crop of rye that I spread there in late November that rye is suppressing some weeds but it's also feeding the microbiology in the soil and creating feeding the microbiology and then I will terminate plant that and terminate it and it just helps my soil life and it's a system I really enjoy doing my so, soil now looks black. So tillage is when you plow the fields? Plow or cultivate or disc 
There's, and now there's a new high speed disc that they've invented that only goes about this deep, but they're really heavy. And I find they compact the soil with doing no tillage in my cover crops. They're breaking up compaction, less trips over the field. And for me as a one man operation, I can manage more acres or the same amount of acres better without doing tillage. And when it rains, the water goes into the soil instead of running off with that system. And if water does run off, the water runs off the field clean. If it's dirty, it's taking nutrients with it and soil with it. Go spray. We'll move it back to the planter. So, uh -huh. so with my no tilt system, this contraption out front is called a trash whipper. It moves last year's residue or some of that cover crop stuff on the top. So it parts it to the side so that we can cut a nice clean trench with our seed discs. Sorry, I didn't plant here at home, you can see it, but it almost looks like a tilled about a four foot wide, four to six foot wide strip. And it's just bare soil right where I put the seed. And then that seed strip, that strip of soil warms up really quickly because it's dark and the seed gets going just like it would if you did tillage in the whole field. Alicia would like to know how many people work with you on your farm. Well, my son drives this tractor planting. Right? He know, he's 11 and he knows about it as well to drive it as I do now. He's been doing it for the last few years. He can drive the combine. He hasn't driven the sprayer yet, but that's that's my help, my kids. So, uh, and with this system, that's it's manageable. Okay. So this tractor is guided with GPS. So I steer around the headland. And once I get an e a straight line out in the field, then it'll steer, it'll drive straight down the field, the proper width from my last pass. So that's what this screen does. You can see where I've driven there. It paints, paints where I've been. My AB line is across here, but I'm not in this field. Should we turn this one on? So it consistently, it makes me that I'm when I'm planting, I'm actually looking at my planter now. In the old days without GPS, I was watching where I was going because you had to drive, well, you weren't driving straight, you were driving with your last mark, which was crooked. So we've got, this is my planter monitor and my planter monitor is also hooked up to my iPad. So this gives me the ability that when I'm done planting, I can take my iPad to the field and it tells me where I've planted, what seeds, what conditions the soil was in, because I've got thing, I've got sensors on the back of that planter that tell me the temperature. This is gonna see the right there on the concrete where the sensors are sitting, we got 57, 56 and a half degrees Fahrenheit right there. And it tells me if I've got a clean furrow it where I'm putting the seeds, whether my trash rippers are engaged with the soil, it tells me furrow moisture. If I go through a wet spot, it this usually runs around 40%. And then this is all my different fields that I'm in. I don't know if it I planted a variable rate map. I it won't bring up my map because I'm not sitting in the field, but I did a prescription prior to planting that in my poor parts of the field it'll drop 30,000 seeds per acre. All and progress up to the best spots in my field at 36,000 seeds per acre. So that puts my seed where I get the most return but you, without without over applying or under applying seeds. And so, that's done over the winter months so based what, on last year's yield history and yield monitor maps. What's a headland? A headland is you usually plant the outside of the field first which is the around outside boundary of the field. Usually I do 60 feet, which is three rounds. That's three rounds of headland. And then you go back and forth across the field in straight line. So the headland is the outside rounds. So I, this gives me all, I can change my downforce here with those hydraulic cylinders. Uh, different. Farmers are very techy now in the 21st century. So there's where I change my downforce. I've got it set at 150 pounds and I can run a diagnose that tells me what every row is doing. Also, my variable rate is there. 
It was planting 33,000 at the last place I was in the field when I came out of the field, that last field. So this is different than what it was when I was a kid. When I was a kid, it was all chain drive like the fertilizer was. And you didn't know if the court, you were looking for seeds on top of the ground when you lifted the planter out at the headland. Where now we know if the, the instant of something's wrong with the planter, this thing's tell, beeping at me and telling me what's wrong, that I need to fix something because the planter's not working properly. So that's the seed side. So typically we'll plant first into that residue and cover crop. And then we have to manage our weeds and terminate that cover crop before our plant comes up, whether it's corn or soybeans. So I, we've got a sprayer here. you drive the sprayer you've got to fill the sprayer so this sprayer has a 4,000 liter tank of a solution tank that's just enough to carry our chemical it's not an irrigator for when it's raining when it doesn't rain we don't need to water we can't possibly put enough water on the field with this unit to irrigate with this is simply we mix water with our chemical to get coverage on whether it's the soil or a plant or an insect, depending on what we're trying to control. So on my next job, because the wheat is at the right stage, I've got the sprayer set up to spray wheat. So if you look there, there's five different nozzles on each nozzle body. I've got a nozzle selected there now that's gonna be a flat fan pattern that sprays like this. It'll cover the whole leaf of the wheat plant at a rate of 20 gallons per acre will give me a nice coverage on that plant. And then I can select different nozzle sizes or different nozzle styles. There's some there that'll put one there that'll go for about 10 gallons. There's streamer, the light blue ones are a streamer that just puts liquid fertilizer on the wheat. I did that a week ago. And then there's some there for fungicide on wheat later on as well. How old is this sprayer? This sprayer is roughly eight years old, I believe. And how long will it last? I hope this sprayer lasts me another 10 to 15 years. It'll still be good after that, but I might want to update technology. And the best way to update technology likely at that time will be to update with a new sprayer. A, a new to me sprayer, let somebody else buy a new sprayer today and I will own it from them down the road. How much chemical is used? So I've got enough, I, for spraying wheat, I've got, there's, I need to spray 20 hectares. If I fill that tank with water and these two and a half jugs, I have to actually split this jug in half. I don't need the whole jug because that's enough for 30 hectares. I need enough for 20, 20 hectares. So I have to split this jug in half. I think that math's right. I know I got to split that jug in half to fill a sprayer. And then I need a jug and a quarter. This is fungicide that I'm going to mix in as well on that pass. On the, I'm going to mix the herb, the herbicide and the fungicide together. And it, that's a it's on the label. It says I can do that. Some, sometimes I got to read the label. Sometimes you can't do that. But in this instance, I can mix the fungicide with my herbicide and make one pass across the field. And what will that do? The herbicide will control my weeds. I've got some flea bane rosettes out in the field. I think Lauren looked at her field. I look after her dad's stuff too, and she found rosette, flea bane rosettes in the field, and Infinity is an excellent herbicide to control those rosettes. If we don't, and there's some other weeds out there as well, like chickweed, there's maybe some dandelion, some other little weeds. If we control them now, now's a perfect time to control them, because if we wait till the wheat's bigger, we cover up the weeds. But now the wheat, if we kill them now, now the wheat is going to, we're in a rapid growth stage here now with wheat. It's going to get up and shade the rest of the soil so no other weeds will grow. And if I don't spray, the guy in the combine seat, which is me, is very unhappy combine and weedy wheat. Weedy wheat. Because it makes, you have to really go slow because of putting all that extra biomass through the combine. And then my straw is not as marketable because it's got weeds in it. So it, it just, 
I looked at some of my wheat fields last fall. I thought, I'm going to try and not spray my wheat fields for herbicide. And this spring, I walked quite a few of my fields. It's like, there's enough weeds in the bottom. We need herbicide. With the experience I've got, if I don't spray, it's going to look ugly come June or July when we need to harvest. Which part of this process would you say is like gardening? What's this part? Well, you always have to... When you look at your walk your garden you're looking at weeds now sometimes you you probably can't use a herbicide you should usually use a hoe i can't go out and weed the weeds out of my wheat because it's so tight together and with weeding out in a garden i we used to scuffle which is cultivating basically and we've just got too many stones we had gullies because of, you're disturbing the soil and the water would run and we wash soil out we'd wash seeds out it was and you'd, with our hillsides and stuff, it, it just didn't work to scuffle. So, so that's how much herbicide we put in here. So you'd fill this tank with water. I've got enough, the water tank's right behind Lauren. I've got water sitting here. I've also got nitrogen sitting here that needs to go on the, my corn acres. Because when we're spraying my corn, we need nitrogen in the program. We, we got the nitrogen in a separate pass a week ago in a different style. But when we use when we spray our corn fields, we'll use 28% nitrogen as our carrier instead of using water as our carrier. And our mm -hmm. idea is we want to spray that and cover the ent entire part of the plant or soil that we're spraying to get coverage to control whatever we're trying to control, whether it's a weed or a, a bug, an insecticide, or a fungus. And what and does the nitrogen do? Nitrogen is part of cause it grows yield without nitrogen you really cut yield it can be a real limiting factor so it helps the plant grow it helps the plant grow it's like fertilizing your lawn with nitrogen if you're going to cut your grass way more if you put nitrogen on your lawn and that's what we with our crops we want them to grow and be healthy but we don't want to over fertilize so i'm not putting on a lot now we used to put all our nitrogen on up front and I, when i say up front at planting time and it was at risk to the environment. And sometimes you put it all on. If we don't get rain in July and August, we don't have a potential. Sometimes we get a real severe drought and we don't have a, a real good crop. So I'm going to put a little bit on it, a half of it up front at planting. And then I'm going to make an assessment the 1st of July. I've got a system on this sprayer that I can put on. And I can put more nitrogen on at tassel time, just pre-tassel time. And I'm two months smarter by the weather. Hey, we've got enough water in the soil. We've got a good crop of corn here. Let's put more nitrogen on. Or, hey, we've got enough nitrogen on the field now. We don't need more. So then we're not over fertilizing and we're not a penalty to the environment as well or a risk of losing it to the environment. So these jugs get dumped into this inductor and this inductor sucks it out of this jug, mixes it with the water that's going through the bottom and gets pumped into the sprayer. There's a flow meter here. So I know how this holds 1080 gallons or 4,000 liters when I fill it. But if I need to do a part tank to finish off a field, I use this digital flow meter and I know exactly how much to put in and I'll measure these jugs, part jugs in to do a part of a field to finish up because we don't want mixed, old, mixed up chemical solution left over. We want to finish off just perfect and then rinse out and and go to a different chemical and a different carrier possibly or, or spray a different crop i don't i can't spray this wheat herbicide on my corn ground it's won't work well so the same we got the same sort of technology up in the cab of the sprayer Have a look at the solution tank it's clean as clean can be it's all empty ready for spray and wheat but that's 4,000 liter that's a 4,000 liter hole that'll fill with chemical solution for spray and wheat or corn or soybeans so this is the GPS beacon that receives the GPS signal for steering
This is the same display as I won't even turn the key on, but my iPad's still on. I got the iPad hooked up to the SIS the same way as the tractor planter was. And these are the controls for running the sprayer. It's fairly simple. It's, it's techy and you're always doing math and usually writing numbers on the side of the window, figuring out what I need for the next tank and how many acres I got left. And it's all about math. Farming is, agriculture is a, little, a lot of math involved and a lot of science. I'm constantly going to school, going to school in the winter to learn new technologies are coming and trying to keep updated on all the technology that's changing, whether it's chemical or plant or machinery, I'm trying to stay up to date. Okay, thanks, Steve. And if anybody has any questions, be sure to put them in the chat so Steve can answer them. Um, okay, Rachel has one. She says, what's your favorite thing about farming? I like that every day is different. Some days I don't know what I'm doing the next day at all. What I'm doing the next day depends on the weather. Last night when I went to bed, we had about six millimeters. I don't know. We'll be on the land on Friday, on Thursday. Got up this morning. There was 30 mils in the rain gauge. Oh, we're not doing anything today for a few days. But there's always things to do. But it's ch constant change. That's what I like about it. And seeing things grow. It's really neat knowing that the stuff you put in the ground and you harvest and you have a good harvest. And it's that's neat to do. And seeing the kids do things. Learning the stuff that when I was there. I'm fine. It's getting easier for them with auto steer and technology to get involved sooner than when I was involved. That's more than one thing that I like. <laughs> Thanks so much, Steve, for a great tour. We really appreciated it. No problem. Any questions, let me know.